Hey, oh, everybody, Zach Gordz here with Revzilla, and welcome to another episode of Daily Rider, where we learn about bikes as we ride. Our guest today may be one of the most famous models in all of motorcycling, and this is the flagship BMW's R1250 GS, a horizontally opposed twin, some truly unique technology, all wrapped up in velvet luxury. Some people say it's the best motorcycle in the world, but is it a good daily rider? Time to find out, kids. All right. <laughs> Okie dokie, everybody. Here we are. R1250 GS. There's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> I think I said the same thing with the uh, Multistrada uh, V4, Honda Africa 2100. Just big, uh, luxurious adventure bikes. There's a whole lot to talk about. So, focus up, Zach. Here we go. First things first, the engine that is a 1254cc horizontally opposed twin. So, uh, the cylinders stick out from either side. Very BMW. Of course, made a lot more sense back in the days of uh, air cooling. <laughs> but... BMW has stuck with it, and it sure is iconic, if nothing else. Uh, single side swing arm, which looks kind of cool, sort of hidden behind the pipe there, but it's single side swing arm, whether it's a Ducati or a BMW GS, whatever, I always think single side swing arm is pretty cool. 19 inch front wheel, um, so not a 21 like on a, a Tenere 700 or an Africa 2100. Uh, yeah, steel braided lines. Um, Good braking equipment in general. BMW brakes are usually quite good. Uh, one thing I do want to mention while we're here, because I'm going to talk about it if I'm halfway decent at my job, is this telelever system. I don't know how well you can see it, uh, but there are uh, two fork tubes. Uh, so sort of a standard fork, right side up fork, um, fairly thin stanchions. I think they're 37 mil or something like that. Uh, but you can see it's braced with an A-arm uh, that goes back to the frame here, um, here and at the top, a little bit difficult to see. What that is though is anti-dive, essentially, so when you get on the brakes, the fork doesn't dive um, under braking, which means you have full suspension travel while you are on the brakes. Pretty uh, pretty nifty, and it's a shock um, that controls the, the damping and all that jazz, not the um, actual fork tubes. So, kind of nifty. You can see the radiators mounted off to the side there. Uh, LED. Headlight, um, adjustable wind protection, we'll get to that later. So the base price of a 1250GS I think is like 18 grand. Of course this one is almost 22, and that's because it has all of the, all the fixings, all the everything. <laughs> uh, it has center stand, heated grips, expanded ride modes, the, um, the tubeless wire spoke, cross spoke wheels, um, the dynamic electronically adjustable suspension might be part of that. I think the chrome headers are part of that. There's a whole gaggle of stuff that you get for upgrading to the premium package, which of course is what BMW provided to us. Okay, that's a key fob, so push button start. And it fires up this big old TFT, um, which we'll dive into a little bit later. And then we'll uh, make the sucker purr. Oh, uh, we'll talk about the saddlebags a little later too, <laughs> uh, if we have time. All right, let's make it happen, shall we? I think it's time. Oh, yeah, uh, came with a GPS, but uh, I took the GPS off because, whatever, it was gonna be distracting. I don't wanna talk about the GPS. It's like 900 bucks for the GPS thing. It's a Garmin, it works pretty well, but I wanted to focus on the dash and uh, the sort of foundation of the bike today. So, no GPS, I think I know where we're going. Doki kids, we are off. So we can jump right into specs. Um, luckily the spec panel that I usually present is pretty simple <laughs> because Lord knows an R1250 GS is not necessarily simple. Um, like I said, 1254cc uh, engine. I believe the claimed horsepower is 136. Claimed torque is 105, which has um, gotta be uh, brake horsepower. And uh, yeah, it's gotta be measured at the crank. The dyno numbers I've seen for this bike, just for reference, this is anecdotal, but um, about 115, 120 horsepower at the wheel and 90, 92 foot-pounds of torque at the rear wheel, which is nothing to sneeze at. 
especially the torque number. That's pretty good. That's like uh, 1290 Super Duke numbers there for torque, which uh, is always the gold standard in my mind. Um, yeah, uh, now that we're at a stop light, the seat height, 33 and a half inches in the low position. The seat is manually adjustable. You can pop it up to 34.3, I think. Um, I experimented with both seating positions. I often like the low seating position as long as I can tolerate the um, seat to peg distance, which in this case I can because it makes the wind protection a little bit better. And as you can see, um, six foot two, flat footing pretty easily at the stoplight. So, so yeah, 33 and a half inch seat height kind of, it reads high to me, but it doesn't feel quite that high to me in actuality, as they say. And yeah, gotta wait for a train. It's a train waiting day, apparently. You get through the rest of our specs. What else are we, what else are we talking about? Oh yeah, uh, fuel capacity, 5.2 gallons. And when that tank is full, uh, the GS on the Daily Rider scales weighed in at 565 pounds um, and that is without the saddlebags saddlebags weighed in uh, at an additional 15 pounds each so 30 pounds um, so the bike as we're riding it right now although the tank's not quite full um, 590 pounds something like that pretty big bike realistically <laughs> okay the minivan's trying to get the jump on me oh i'm gonna get i got gotcha, you gotcha. Yes. And a quick shifter, of course, on uh, this highfalutin model of GS, up and down. So uh, clutch left shifts and clutch down shifts. The ergonomics on this bike, really, really good, really comfortable. <laughs> the big downside to the bike is that it's tall and big and heavy. Um, if those are things that are agreeable to you as a as a motorcyclist then you will find this cockpit and this place to sit very comfortable cheese louise and cheese people all right we're out onto the freeway on the r1250 gs it's not so free this way right now it's kind of slow we're going 60 miles an hour i am going to adjust the wind protection though so that's um windscreen all the way up uh, which is obviously a pretty nice system. Just spin that little dial. Not as slick as um, the Multistrada system, the old pinch and slide. I really, really like that system a lot. It's quite good. And as cars pull in front of me and I'm in, in traffic here, I'm reminded that uh, the GS will have the same radar system that the uh, Multistrada V4 I tested uh, had but this one does not. This is a 2020 model that I'm riding. Um, BMW North America has not told me as of the publishing of this video when the radar bikes will be on US shores, but that's technology that uh, potential GS owners can look forward to, I suppose, because as we learned on the Multistrada V4, it was pretty impressive. This is just a regular old $22,000 GS. <laughs> no radar here, <laughs> not yet anyway. And one feature I don't want to forget to talk about is cruise control, which uh, is this guy over here. Um, slide this little tower over to the right, and then this little toggle switch, uh, you push it forward, and it'll set cruise control. And it's not particularly cold, but you know what? I'm gonna turn on the heated grips anyway, just because I can. Got vented gloves on, and it's 64 degrees, <laughs> which is a perfectly reasonable temperature to be riding motorcycles but I'm gonna flick on the heated grips. As usual, fuel mileage will vary a lot based on how you're riding. Um, as with most motorcycles, I don't understand why the GS isn't geared higher. Uh, sixth gear, 3000 RPM, it's got lots of roll on power right now, but we're only going 55, 60 miles an hour. Fifth and sixth gear are basically the same as far as I can tell. There's very, very little ratio change when you upshift from fifth to sixth, for example, and I don't understand why sixth gear isn't just a, an overdrive gear, so you can go 75, 80 miles an hour and still just crank along at a really low RPM. It's, it's a shaft drive, so there's no chain sprockets, so you can't just change a sprocket to change gearing. You have to change the rear end, which is a lot more complicated. The price you pay, of course, for no chain maintenance, which is a plus, I would, I think, in, in my book anyway. Don't ever have to lube a chain because everything's bathed in oil down there. But uh, yeah, kind of a 
um, kind of a bummer if you want to change gearing, which I would, I don't know, I would want to do it, I just don't know how bad I would want to do it, <laughs> or how, how much effort I'd want to put in um, to doing it. Theoretically, you can go well north of 250 miles on a tank, but I think you're going to be filling up more around 200, um, and that's fine. I think 200 is a, a good benchmark for a long distance machine, so I don't have a problem with that fuel range. Yeah, because I procrastinated so much on the highway, I forgot to talk about mirrors. I just don't want to forget to mention the mirrors on the GS are a little small, but really nice shape and uh, very, very smooth. Also one of the benefits of the horizontally opposed twin. That's kind of BMW's thing. Uh, I just fudged up the first footless stop. We're 0 for 1 on the GS. Not a great start. Here we go. Footless stop. We can do it. We can do it. Nope. Couldn't do it. Interesting. I was just about to say that the balance of the GS is really, really good at low speed, uh, which I think is true. Um, it's remarkably agile. The turning radius is good, as we'll experiment with later. Um, yeah, I just, I'm always impressed at how kind of light on its feet the GS feels, considering how big and tall it is. Uh, but I have to say, the footless stops are not going particularly well right now, are they? Here we go. Third one. Nope. Didn't do that one either. Interesting. Very interesting, Zach. My perception of the GS being well balanced, by the way, is uh, is has been born over years of experimentation. I mean, I've done U-turns on single lane gravel roads without putting my foot down on a GS, and it just works really well. Um, my footless stop test, though, not going so well. Ha! Huh, okay, I pulled that one off, but that was not graceful. Jeez, interesting. All right, last stop sign coming up that we usually count in the stop sign challenge. My confidence is very shaky right now, very shaky. Here we go, here we go, here we go. We can do this. First gear, come to a stop. Okay, okay, I done did it. But man, a lot of focus, not terribly elegant. I just can't tell you how surprised I am about that. One of the things I love about BMWs is the traction control adjustment on the fly. So if I hold this button down here, TC off, boom, just like that. If I hold it down again, boom, TC on. If I hold it down for a little bit longer, TC off, and then ABS off. Hold it down again, TC off. Now they're both off. Hold it down again, a little bit longer. Now both are on again. So yeah, boom, while you ride, don't have to shut the throttle off, don't have to do anything shut off ABS, shut off traction control, if that's what you want to do. I appreciate that they gave me that power. <laughs> but holy smokes, we're almost through Lover's Lane. I didn't talk about passenger accommodations. Oh my God, way behind the curve here. Uh, the GS is quite comfortable. So says my lady friend anyway. Yeah, the only thing that makes a GS better from the standpoint of my regular passenger is a top box, because then she can lean back on it. Uh, but I've traveled, uh, all over California with her on the back. I've ridden in Europe um, lots and lots and lots of miles on a GS with uh, my lady friend on the back and she loves it. Which, uh, again, you're gonna spend 22,000 bucks on a motorcycle. Um, good to have your roommate sign on, in my opinion. All right, into the twisty road section here. Looks like we got a spot of rain. So I'm gonna be a little bit careful, especially on the tar snakes. They are unforgiving when wet. Um, but uh, what I can tell you is that the GS, if you haven't ridden one, will almost certainly surprise the hell out of you on a twisty road. Flick it left, right, lean way over, drag the toes of your boots. It's, it's so low effort for such a huge and complex motorcycle. So I think a Multistrada or a KTM 1290 Super Adventure S, other 19 inch uh, front wheel adventure bikes, I do think they feel a little sportier and a little more conventional in a way that's uh, familiar and welcome when you're really on the edge of the tire. I think that the GS does have better balance and, um, and better stability. For example, you come into a corner like this, so let's go into this corner a little bit too fast. I'm on the brakes, I'm on the brakes, I gotta stay on the brakes as I lean over. Again, when I get off the brakes, the front end doesn't come back up because it never dove in the first place. Um, that kind of stuff is pretty cool. 
And I think that for a sport touring machine like the GS really is, it's remarkable technology. It's unique and worth talking about. Right, out of the twisty road section. Actually, I'm gonna turn off uh, TC right here because as we know, sometimes, oop, yellow light. All right, on the brakes. We can take off here and uh, experiment with some of the power a little bit here. Second gear. Woo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> Woo. It's a weird way that this thing makes horsepower. It's sort of like, it's very Teutonic, very German, almost emotionless. Whatever you ask for, it just sort of like salutes and says, okay, that is what I'll give you. And if you ask it to do a wheelie, it says, okay, and it does it. But I don't know, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's all the marketing and all the mumbo jumbo around the, the company permeating my skull, but. It always just feels like it, uh... <laughs> you know that little pop it gave when it shifted from first to second? A little MotoGP pop, and it went up a gear. I'm gonna need to talk about this dash at some point, but I just don't know if I'm gonna have time. <laughs> it is such a big, situation. I do appreciate uh, the sort of the matte bezel um, and the matte finish. It makes it seem kind of clean. There's very, very little glare, which is excellent. Air temp over here. Um, it's telling me what ride mode I'm in up here. So with this uh, button over here, I can tell it I want to be in road, dynamic pro, enduro pro, or rain. And it's a green light. So we're going with road. <laughs> Those people are bitching at each other via their horns. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a clean setup. The tack is, uh, I've never been a huge fan of the sort of bar tack thing, but that's the way the gun these days. So many, many motorcycle companies go with the bar tack. Um, sort of a space saver. Speed, gear position indicator, it's all very just large and crisp and clear and clean and yet colorful. It has a sort of, um, there's some flair. It's got a luxury feel to it, which, uh, you know, you come to expect for 20 grand or so. One thing I don't like about the gear position indicator is that little hat it always puts on the numbers. See the little hat? It's telling me to upshift from 5th to 6th. Like, I'm only, I'm only going 50 miles an hour. Get off my back about it. Okay, so the top of the dash up here, that's fuel gauge. If I tap this top men menu button, I can toggle through what I see at the top. So I can see um, total, uh, trip one, tire pressure monitoring system, TPMS, that uh, also comes in the full zoot package that came on this bike. Uh, range to empty and then uh, fuel capacity, uh, fuel gauge in general. So if I hold down on the, uh, or sorry, tap down on the menu button, then I enter all this mumbo jumbo. I can go to navigation, media, telephone, settings, all this stuff uh, down here. If I tap down again, I go to um, uh, information page about the vehicle, so coolant temperature, battery voltage, more TPMS info, um, onboard trip computer, this is where you come to reset trip one or trip two. Um, if you hold down on the upside of the button, it brings you back to the main screen, which I believe is all I'm going to have time to talk about right now. Yeah, green light. Uh, it is a vast and fairly complex dash system. All things considered, I think the this dash on the GS is very much like the GS itself. It's uh, it's unique, it's quirky, it takes some getting used to. It is nicely built, well put together, understandable once you know the secret handshake. Plan to spend some time getting to know it and don't necessarily judge it from your first experience is what I'd say. Uh, well, we're at this red light here. I know there's a very bumpy section road coming up so I'm gonna hold down the suspension button and I'm going to put it in uh, minimum preload. And if I tap this suspension button again, I can toggle between road and dynamic damping modes. Road is the softer of the two for some reason. Um, so now I'm in the softest suspension mode. And when you do this, this thing rides like a Cadillac, man. It is so soft. So this bumpy section of road, I don't know if you can see the fork dancing around down there, um, but it's just really plush. And, uh, I think it's great. <laughs> Some people think it's like too squishy and soft. But I think the way the bike rides like this, like especially on the freeway, 
be riding all day, like riding along on the cloud. <laughs> One thing I did want to address about the GS that I thought was interesting is among the many Instagram questions that were thoughtful and creative, were a lot of very, very snarky comments and sarcasm about how like, oh, are you going to ride that GS to Starbucks? Or, oh, don't forget to take it in for the brake recall. What a piece of crap. I can't believe this thing's way too heavy to ride off road. Why would you need 135 horsepower to ride off road? And I thought that was kind of surprising, but I think I, dis I, think I deciphered what the, um, what the deal is with, uh, all the sort of, um, venom being spit at the GS, which is that it's the standard bearer, right? It's, it's, um, it's known as a, a luxury brand. First of all, it's known as the luxury model. It's famous. Um, people have for a long time expected it to be one of the best motorcycles in the world. And it's fun to take pot shots at that uh, particular machine. Um, and it's easy also to expect a lot from the bike. So if a, you know, if a, $4,500 dual sport has a front brake recall, you know, people are sort of like, oh, well, you know, I guess that happens, you know, it's too bad for that company, but you know, that's a, that's the thing that happens. Whereas if there's a brake recall for a $20,000 luxury bike, everyone's get, gets up in arms and they're like, oh, what the heck, man? Like kidding me, bull crap. Like what kind of cheap crap are they trying to sell me on this bike with a brake recall? So you can have your own opinions about uh, whether or not I've cracked the code and why all the GS hate gets sprayed around, but um, that's something that occurred to me. And I would say that I'm uh, I'm a victim of it too. I expect a lot of this bike <laughs> because of what it is. So maybe it's not all wrong. All right, everybody. Dirt shortcut. Let's do Enduro Pro. So I've got the, the Pro dongle here, which means I get Dynamic Pro and Enduro Pro ride modes. So this is auto preload, which means it's going to feel how much weight is on the bike and adjust the preload. Other machines do this as well. It's kind of a nifty feature. And then I'm going to put the, um, oh, in enduro riding mode, damping not adjustable. Okay. So it goes into its own, uh, riding mode, um, which feels pretty soft, but we'll see how it takes on the, uh, the rest of the, the rest of the dirt here. And I got TC off for very obvious reasons. I hope. <laughs> -hoo 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 -hoo. We're whipping through the dirt here, kids. Oh boy. And <laughs> it's wagging its back end around. It's got uh, linked brakes, so when you get on the front brakes, the rear brakes apply as well. And we don't have a small jump anymore. But we do have a big one that we can hit. Here we go, everybody. Second gear, GS jump. <laughs> Center stand flopped down and hit the ground. Suspension did not bottom out though. Um, it's a very impressive bike off-road. Someone commented on Instagram, oh, why even bother? Uh, why not just get a Goldwing? They're literally just touring bikes, so what's the difference? Well, I'd like to see you hit that jump on a Goldwing, frankly. Um, the GS always impresses me with its poise off-road. It's, uh, it's a pretty nifty, <laughs> it's a pretty nifty machine. Actually, you know what? Instead of going on the pavement, I'm gonna go over here on the dirt. I'm gonna do some more dirt. <laughs> I'll do a little U-turn around this box. Spin the tire up to pivot the bike. Amazingly easy to do. <laughs> what a machine. Um, Pretty, nifty, machine. All right, we're gonna flick it over to Dynamic Pro. And we already know that the little Mamma Jamma can do wheelies, but why not one more, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> it's so exciting. Woo. It's a really exciting bike. We're gonna have to find out if we can back it in. So I gotta hold this down. And there we go, ABS off. There we go. <laughs> Backing it in. 570 pound. 
adventure touring bike. <laughs> again, again, the my um, my overall feeling on balance is uh, was not reflected necessarily in the. Um, oop, almost hit the guy with the picket there. Excuse me, fellas. Yeah, it was not reflected in the stop sign challenge, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's a pretty fun bike. U-turn test. All right, we should be good here. Steering sweep on GS is usually quite good. So we're gonna come to a basically a complete stop. Less than two parking spaces. I think that was tighter than the MT-07. So pretty good. Yeah, it's uh, one of the things I really appreciate about the GS is that uh, good turning radius. Let's think about sport bikes and some sport nakeds and stuff. Man, they got such crappy turning radius. GS. Oh, you know what we'll do? Throw it up on the center stand because that's a thing that it's got. Nice feature for any bike like this, in my opinion. We'll take a listen to that snarl as best we can hear it past the saddlebag. I don't know. Not everybody loves it. I think it's a uh, pretty cool sounding bike though. And there we have it. R1250 GS. We romped it around. <laughs> I hope you guys had fun with that. I had fun. That was great. Instagram questions. First question is from Striker ADV who asks, is the GS still the benchmark bike that all larger adventure bikes are measured against? So the short answer is yes, I think that it is because it has so much pedigree and so much history. It's easy to track along a timeline how the GS has improved and how everyone else has matched up to it. However, I think that the competition has gotten good enough that the GS isn't necessarily the best bike. I mean, in my opinion, five years ago, the Multistrada, the, uh, the KTM 1190, um, bikes like that were, were taking a stab at certain sections of the GS market share and you could ride a ktm and you could, uh, 1190 and you could say well yeah i mean it's just it's better off-road you know it's better balance it's got better suspension for off-road that kind of thing um you could ride a multistrada and you could say like oh, it's just a better sport bike you know like as as a as a sport bike in the adv world it's better than a gs but overall to me the gs was just it was quite a bit better it did everything in a way that an, another bike didn't but now i think it's getting to the point a multistrada v4 is its own animal it's not better than a GS in my opinion, but it's not worse. It does some things that a GS just doesn't do and it doesn't give up a lot. Um, and the same thing with a KTM 1290. Um, so yeah, I think it's, uh, we're getting to a point where if the GS wants to be the clear king of the mountain, they're going to have to make a big step forward. Next question is from Rover43, who says, GS or GSA? Um, yeah, so the GSA has a slightly taller suspension, a little bit more suspension travel, and of course a big gas tank, 7.9 or 8-gallon gas tank, um, and it has a little bit more wind protection. It's a sort of bigger, heavier um, piece of equipment. I like the GSA. I, that's probably what I would get because I like the fuel range, and I don't care that it's huge because this is huge anyway. So, and if you're going to ride it off-road, if you're going to ride single track a lot on your GS, you probably prefer to have this than the GSA, but the GSA is the one that I would get um, because I don't mind that it's tall and I like the big gas tank. Reyes underscore FZ uh, asks, compared to the new Multistrada V4, what is the interval oil change and valve check for this machine? Yeah, so the I believe it's 12,000 miles for valve checks on this 1250gs which yeah is three times as often as a multi-shot v4 so um something to keep in mind you know i mean that that fact that that um you know multi-shot v4 is 30 whatever 36,000 37,000 miles um for valve checks the new harley pan america is never check your valves ever <laughs> so again i think if uh, bmw wants to if they want to be the standard bearer they gotta move in a direction where they really don't leave any chinks in the armor um so yeah hopefully that helps Next question, um, Mike Luddy asks, is it a noticeable improvement over the R1200 GS? Um, this is a good question because, um, yeah, the R1200 GS has a lot of the same features. I mean, I rode an R1200 GS Adventure um, from Fairbanks, Alaska to Prudhoe Bay, the top of Alaska. Um, and yeah, I spent whatever it was, like almost a week on that bike. And it's the same heated grips, it's the same TFT dash, it's the same wheel set, it's the same suspension technology, it's the same stuff in large part, you know. The bike 
<laughs> yeah, and I mean, I set the cruise control at 95 miles an hour and cruised along on a gravel road for hours. Um, it was a super impressive machine. And the 1250 is an evolution of that, but it is not a huge evolution. Um, so is it a noticeable improvement? Only just, <laughs> in my opinion. And I think if someone was going to say, if someone said to me, oh, I think I'm going to get an R1200 GS um, instead of the 1250, I would say, yeah, sure, do that. You, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Um, there's a lot of the same technology available. And um, even though it doesn't have some of the new whiz bangs and doodads, uh, it's still a, still a great bike um, and, and arguably close enough to the top of the evolutionary food chain of GSs that it'll keep you satisfied. Next question is from CJ underscore J15, who asks, does it have that variable valve timing razzmatazz? <laughs> is it noticeable? Um, right, so uh, I have not talked about this the whole time. Um, as you can see, it says shift cam here on the um, valve cover. And yeah, in there, there is a, there's a little system, a little servo that moves um, the, uh, the, the camshaft over and it changes the, the, the cam profile lift duration that kind of stuff and um i would say it is just noticeable if you're really reaching for it if i got on this bike and no one told me that that was a thing that happened i don't think i would have said oh man it just feels so crazy and different and like you feel these two surges of power and you hear it click and clack and rattle like you do on a honda vtec one and um uh, like a honda you know vfr 800 which sounds like there's a wrench in the uh, top end sometimes um i don't think i would have really put it together it just feels like a strong engine to me um maybe i'm uh numb dullard who doesn't uh, pick up on things but um to me it's not a it's not a not a sea change um it's cool technology um it makes a already complex bike even more complex which it depends on your opinion of whether or not that's uh good or not <laughs> um but uh but yeah it does have the technology i do think that it's cool but it doesn't obviously keep me from recommending a 1200gs as you just heard <laughs> uh, next question is from barnacle heart um who asks is there any reason to buy this over an f850gs or a tiger 900 i can just picture all the middleweight adv bikes singing anything you can do i can do better so what you get with a full-size bike whether it's a full-size adv i should say whether it's a 1250gs or um a 1290ktm or uh, a you know adventure bike or a multi strata v4 you get luxury I me mean, i don't think that i would get um an 850 or a 900 mid-sized adv because if you're going to do that then just go full zoot if you can afford it i mean i i don't think that the amount of big that this bike is is discernibly worse than one of those bikes i i don't know and i like the the shaft drive i like the boxer twin i like the stuff the the tail lever suspension and fa50 doesn't have any of that and yeah it's cheaper but if I'm going to go small ADV, I'm going to go T7, or I'm going to go, I don't know, even a KLR 650 or something, you know, like go some, go, go small and simple uh, for real, if you're going to do it. All right. Next question is from Andreas G Tech, not Andreas's first question that I've answered, I don't think. Uh, the question is, is the GS quote too heavy for off-road use, or is this entirely dependent on the individual's grit and budget for potential repairs? I really like the way this question is phrased because there are a lot of people that said like, oh, you can't take a GS off road, it's too big. Um, well, you can. Um, I've done it. I've I participated in the GS Trophy in Thailand in 2016. I watched GSs roll end over end down a gravel hill and then stood upright and started and ridden again. They, You can do it. It doesn't make sense. If you want a dirt bike, get a dirt bike. Don't expect it to be an XR650 or a KTM 350XC. It's not a real dirt bike. And I get it. But also, it is re remarkably rugged and capable of trundling down a gravel road or even doing a little bit of single trail as long as it's a uh, single track, excuse me, as long as it's wide enough. Um, so I like this question because yes, it is dependent on the individual's grit and budget for potential repairs. Okay, that is it for Instagram questions. Um, I just have one more thing I wanted to show you guys because I did get one question about this. Um, these are the BMW Vario saddlebags. Come, they're like 1100 bucks, which is expensive for saddlebags. No two ways about it. And this right saddlebag is, this is my least favorite part, is that it has all this like space from the muffler is taken up. So you can't put a whole lot in there. One nice thing about these bags that's really cool is this is the BMW Vario bags, which means they uh, vary in size. So if you take this lever and you push it down, you get uh, a bunch more space in there. Um, and then you can close it, same as before, um, or you can make it smaller. 
and a little bit narrower. Um, it is a really nifty system, um, and it's something I got a couple questions about, so I wanted to address it. Uh, and yeah, okay, that's it. Let's get on to the leaderboard already, son of a gun. Uh, bear with me. Okay. <laughs> All right, here we are in Revzilla West. Um, a little bit hectic, as usual. Um, Daily Rider leaderboard, orderly, as usual, I think you'll find. <laughs> We've got the BMW R1250GS ready to go on the leaderboard. And um, quick reminder of um, where we stand here, you know, the podium, uh, that's Ducati Multistrada V4 with radar uh, versus 650LT, just very good overall bike, as we know. Triumph Tiger 850 Sport, which nobody ever talks about or even cares about, as far as I can tell, but it is actually a fantastic um, functional machine. So we're messing with the podium here with the, with the 1250GS. So where do we think? Versus 650LT, is it better than a Versus 650? Whew, man, is it close. I mean, especially if you talk price, like you could have two, maybe three <laughs> Versus 650s. Uh, I mean, brand new, you could have two. Let's be fair, uh, but man, that's something to consider, certainly. Um, if they're sitting side by side in the garage, most days I'm gonna take that GS. It's just that good. So, Multistrada V4S. The valve interval thing's amazing. As a sport touring bike, it's fantastic. Wind protection's good. Range is pathetic. Eh, maybe not pathetic, but bad on the Multistrada V4. So that's a nod to the GS. It's got radar. This GS does not, so that's a nod to the Ducati. <sighs> I really like the dash system on the Ducati. The suspension adjustability is good. <sighs> I don't know. I think though, if it comes down to it, which bike would I rather take down a dirt road? Which bike would I be least sad to see tip over on a gravel road or a piece of trail or something like that? GS. I know some people will say, oh, I saw it coming all along. I knew it was going to be the GS. The GS was bound to be at the top. So predictable, ridiculous. Yeah, but there it is. I think, I think it's, it's that good as a piece of engineering. I think, though, the Multistrada V4S, KTM 1290 Super Adventure S, which deserves to be on this board at some point, those bikes are so close now. They're so close. A GS is not better outright than a Multistrada V4S. But it's my leaderboard and I think I would lean toward the GS. I like, I like the, the, the fit and finish, the polish on it, um, especially from an engineering standpoint, it's, it's a tour de force still. But BMW, word of warning, they coming for you. You better, better step it up. If it, the next evolution is only as much as this one, you're in real trouble. So there you have it, BMW R1250GS on the Daily Rider leaderboard. Thanks as always for watching. I hope you enjoyed yourself and I hope to see you next time on Daily Rider. See everybody. I don't know how long this red light's gonna last, but maybe we can talk about the dash a little bit more. Someone else, you'd think I'd know this green light better by now, or this traffic light better by now. Whose turn is it next? I don't want to start talking if someone else is going to go. Who's up? There we go. Those folks. Okay. So the top of the... Um